This week we come to the eighth of our stories, and in the world of numerology, little attention is given to this number. For some reason, of all the numbers, eight is the one to which little regard is paid. And in our eighth story, a husband pays little regard to his wife's nightmares. We all of us suffer the agony of nightmares from time to time, but we wake and the horror vanishes in the reality of day. There are some dreams, though, which are not like that, dreams which return again and again, dreams which have been there since childhood, dreams which demand that attention be paid. In my story, however, the husband says to his wife, You mustn't let it worry you. Dreams may be frightening sometimes, but they don't really mean anything. The husband is wrong, and you are about to discover why in story number eight. The face. Penny for them. What did you say? I said a penny for your thoughts. You've been staring out of that window for at least ten minutes. I might just as well be back in Hammersmith. I'm sorry. Are I you didn't... all right? I'm fine. Well, you're very pale. Is it the heat? It simply has no effect on me. <sighs> Richard hates it. He says he can never understand how he came to fall in love with a salamander. There's nothing wrong between you. How do you mean? Wrong between you and Richard. Celia, just because I happen to stare out of the window for a few minutes doesn't mean my marriage is on the rocks. I have every reason in the world to be happy. But you're not. Who says I'm not? Oh, come off it. We've known each other for far too long for you to try and hide something from me. What is it? It's nothing. Leave it alone. Nothing that you want to talk about. Nothing worth talking about. Tell me. It's a dream and Tell people who talk me. about... Oh, it's not worth talking about. You never know. Dream or nightmare? Both. Do you really want to hear of it? Of course I do. Well, it's a dream I often used to have as a child. I haven't had it for years, but last night it came back again. There's nothing particular about the dream itself, but the way it used to be was that the night after I'd had that dream, there would be another one, a real nightmare, and I used to scream out loud in my sleep. It's ten years since I last had that dream, and now the first dream... The warning dream has come again. I'm dreading what's going to happen tonight. What happens? Can you remember? Every detail. But I'll tell you about the first dream so you'll understand. It's quite harmless, really. I'm walking on a sandy cliff covered with short down grass. I'm about 20 yards from the edge and I can hear the sea below. There's a path which I follow which goes steadily upwards. And there are always stiles which I have to climb over. There are sheep grazing, but I never see another human being. It's early evening, and I have to hurry because there's someone who is waiting for me. Someone who's been waiting not just for a little while, but for many years. And there, in front of me, is a little wood where the trees have grown crooked from the wind off the sea. And I know that my journey is nearly over. That this person, whose name I do not know, is waiting for me somewhere close at hand. I have to walk through these trees. The boughs almost roof in the path from the sky. It, it's like walking through a tunnel. And then the trees start to thin out and I can see the grey tower of a church which stands all by itself. Around it is a graveyard which has not been used for a long time. The main body of the church, between the tower and the edge of the cliff, is in ruins, roofless, with gaping windows and ivy growing round them. Then what happens? That's all. That's all there is. You mean it always stops there? Always. 
I used to dream it over and over again when I was a child. And always exactly the same. Yes, except that last night something was different. It was as if, in the years since I last had the dream, the church and the graveyard had changed. The edge of the cliff had come nearer to the tower. It was within two or three yards of it, and the whole body of the church had gone over into the sea. There was just one broken arch still standing. But there's nothing particularly frightening in that. I've had much worse dreams. I told you there's nothing frightening in the first dream. It's in the one that follows that the horror begins. What happens? <laughs> it isn't so easy to describe. Partly because my mind keeps trying to shut it out, I suppose. I try to tell myself if I don't think about it, it won't come. But it always does. At least... <laughs> It always used to. But you aren't a child anymore. Perhaps it won't be the same. It's not like any ordinary nightmare. I'm walking at the foot of the... Darling, oh. I'm home. Oh, Lord. There's Richard. I don't want to talk about it in front of him. He'd think I was going soft in the head. Look, I'll give you a ring tomorrow. Oh, this heat's a scandal. An abomination. Celia, hello. Lovely to see you. It's all right, Richard. Don't bother to be polite. I'm just going. Uh, hello, darling. Hello. I'm on my way out. Bye, Hester. Bye. I'll ring you if I don't hear from you. Bye, Richard. Bye, Celia. Ah, what sin have we committed that Providence should frizzle us up in a frying pan? <laughs> Let's thwart Providence, Hester. I'll whisper so that he won't hear. Let's drive out. And have a quiet, cool dinner somewhere along the river. The very thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Providence didn't hear us. I'll go and change. Uh, oh, any letters for me? Uh, two or three. They don't look very interesting. Uh, receipted bill. Hmm. Circular begging letter. Dear sir or madam, cheek. Asking me to subscribe to something without bothering to ascertain my sex. Private view. 17th century portraits at the Walton Gallery. Hester, mm -hmm. do you want to go to a private view at the Walton? I've got meetings all day. Somebody said that there were some Van Dykes that had never seen the light of day. When is it? Uh, Friday. I might go with Celia. She rather cares for that kind of thing. Oh, I'll leave the card on the tray. That was a marvellous meal, darling, I must say. Sometimes you have the most wonderful ideas. Good food, good wine, and a fresh breeze off the river. It even feels cooler in here. <sighs> well, we'll keep the windows open. Well, I'm going straight to bed. I'm too sleepy even to take my makeup off. I'll be with you soon. But there's a few things I've got to check in these accounts first, before tomorrow. Must you? I won't be long. deep cliff and above me I can see the tower of the church the sea must have beaten and beaten away at the cliff until it brought the nave crashing down broken pieces of stone everywhere are they all that's left of the church and here's a piece of gravestone who departed this and there's a grave still there, up on the edge of the cliff. It's coming. It's going to show itself. Run, run. I can't move. I can't move. Try not to look. Try not to look at what's in the cliff face. I can't move my eyes. Look away. Look at the sea. I can't. It is there. The face. The face staring at me out of the cliff. Don't look. The eyes are looking into mine. The lips are moving. I am coming for you now, Esther. I am coming for you. My bride. 
Esther, my darling, what is it? What's the matter? Wake up! Keep him away! Keep him away! What are you going on about? There's no one here. It was just a dream. It was a dream, just as it always was. Oh, I'm so frightened. He said he would come. Who said he would come? Dreams may frighten you sometimes, but they, they don't really mean anything. <laughs> he can't harm you. The eyes were grey, set very close together, and they looked steadily at me all the while. He had red hair, growing low on the forehead. His nose was long, and the mouth... On, on one side, it was almost beautiful and very sensual. On the other, it was deformed or burnt. And the face stared at me as if it lusted after me. And that was the dream you used to have when you were a child? Yes, the same dream. You mean you knew he was lusting after you even then? I probably wouldn't have put it like that, but now I remember. I remember the lips. They said when I was a child, I shall come for you when you are older. And last night, they said, I am coming for you now. And, and ten years ago, the ruined nave of the church still stood on the edge of the cliff, but now it's fallen away into the sea and only the tower is left standing there. Oh. And I was so determined I wouldn't let it get hold of me. <laughs> when I woke up this morning, I told myself I was afraid of nothing other than my own fear. That evil face had come to me in dreams over and over again when I was a child, and it did me no harm except to make me afraid. But now I know it is drawing nearer to but me. But how can it? How can a person in a dream do you any harm? <laughs> come on. Let's go to the gallery. Sir Charles Cotterell. By William Dobson. He's very red in the face. Who's the girl who's falling out of her dress? That, my dear, is the Duchess of Portsmouth. Ooh, no question about the secret of her success. She must have been lovely, though. And who are the couple over in the corner? Uh, Sir Arthur and Lady Ferguson. They look as if they've just had one hell of a row and the painter caught them before they'd had time to put their faces straight. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't possibly have wanted to be painted looking like that. <laughs> Richard said there was supposed to be some Van Dykes. Where are they? Oh, room three. Just through here. Lord Crofts. What a superbly aristocratic nose. Oh! What is it? What's the matter? You look as if you've seen a ghost. Whose portrait is that? The man with the red hair? Mm. Uh, uh, Sir Roger Wyburn. Oh, trembling from head to foot. What on earth is it? That is him. That is the face in my dream. Does it say anything about him? Nothing. Just portrait of Sir Roger. Come on, let's get you out of here. You look as if you're going to pass out. One large gin and tonic. Thanks. Oh. God, I'm sorry to make such a fuss. How stupid. You're certain it was the same. You can't be mistaken about a face that's haunted you all your life. What does it all mean? Who, who was Roger Wyburn, anyway? And what's he got to do with you? If only I knew. There must be some way of finding out. I have a friend who sometimes does research for writers. He might be able to help. Oh, are you going to be all right? Shall I get you a taxi? I'm meeting Richard at five and he's driving us down to the cottage in Rye. We're going to have a golfing weekend. Perhaps fresh air and exercise are what I really need. I am coming for you now, Esther. Hester, 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 wake up, for God's sake, wake up, Hester. Hester, is it your dream again? Yes, yes, 
did. It was my dream. Oh, I'll tell you. Look, I know we haven't been married long, but it's time I knew. I suppose you're right, but, but you mustn't interrupt. You must just let me tell it. The moment we get back to London, you're going to see Dr. Baring. Now, what good will that do? He can't give me pills to stop me dreaming. No, but he might help you to find out why you have these dreams. <clears throat> there must be some explanation. And the Van Dyke portrait was the absolute likeness of the face in your dreams? In every detail, Doctor. Uh, then you've every reason to be reassured. I've only the sketchiest knowledge of psychoanalysis, but this seems to be a classic instance of the way in which the mysterious subconscious flows beneath the surface of human life. Like some dark underground river, as one of my colleagues once put it. Or, um, to put it in plain terms, I think that you may have seen that portrait when you were very young. Not the thing itself, perhaps, but a reproduction in a book or periodical. And no doubt it made a very deep impression on you. It awoke something in you which your conscious mind immediately suppressed so that the terror it inspired in you could surface only in dreams. But why should it come to the surface now? Oh, who knows, my dear Hester, who knows? Everything's all right between you and Richard, I suppose? What do you mean? Oh, you know, everything. Oh, yes. No problems in that direction. Good, good. Glad to hear it. Well, Hester, I don't find anything at all to be alarmed about. You're a perfectly healthy young woman. But you are run down, and I suspect that's the cause of the trouble. The return of your childhood nightmare isn't a, a cause, but more likely a symptom. What you need is a change of air. But surely, Doctor... Get out of this airless furnace into some quiet place where you've never been before. There's no associations for you. And don't let Richard come with you. What you need is a complete change. Uh, somewhere on the East Coast, perhaps. Suffolk, Norfolk. Ever been there? Never. My mother's family came from Southwold or somewhere, but I've never been. Sea air, complete idleness. Uh, no long walks, no long bathings. Short, bracing dip and a deck chair by the sea. Cut yourself off completely. And I know just the place. Rushton. A quiet little hotel by the sea where it's impossible to do anything at all. My dearest darling Richard, bless you for another lovely long letter. There is simply nothing to report about my life here. I loll around in a deck chair all day long, digesting enormous meals and thinking of... What do I think of? I want to say I think of him, but I don't. I can scarcely even remember the details of his face. It's as if something had come between us. As if I was seeing him through glass. As if Richard were a memory of something that had happened a long time ago. <sighs> Thinking of getting home again. Baring was quite right, though. The treatment is certainly working. No more nightly visitations. Hmm. <laughs> No dreams at all, in fact, that I can recall. And every morning I wake to another day. The trouble is that if I go on with this kind of life much longer, I'm going to grow into a mindless noodle and start putting on weight. So tomorrow I shall try a little undemanding exercise, I think. A leisurely walk, perhaps. But not a very long one. Well, madam... You could try going over to Minsborough. There's nothing much to see there now, but it's not far, and it is quite a pleasant walk. It's oof, about a couple of miles. I might manage that. Which way do I go? You see there, just beyond the marsh, mm -hmm. that hill with a little wood on top of it. Mm -hmm. That's where you make for. But I don't know whether you ought to be going out today, madam. It's so close. Feels like there's going to be a storm. I think I'll chance it. I'd be quite grateful for a storm. It's getting so heavy, I might as well be back in London. There are sheep grazing. And there's the little wood. There 
there's someone who's waiting for me. Someone who's been waiting for me, not just for a little while, but for many years. The landscape of my dream. Here all the time on the other side of the marsh. The path, the stiles, the wood, and beyond it the church tower. And the trees are like a tunnel all around me, leading me on. And I know that my journey is nearly over. That this person, whose name I do not know, is waiting for me somewhere close at hand. But now I do know his name. Will I find him there, waiting for me? The trees are beginning to thin out. And there is the church tower. And there's only one broken arch between the tower and the cliff edge. No one. No one waiting for me. Only the tower and sea and gravestones crumbling on the edge of the cliff. Is this all that my fear amounts to? Is this what's been pursuing me all these years? It's time to go back. The storm is coming this way. One gravestone standing alone, about to slide into the sea. Here lies all that was once mortal of Roger Wyburn. Night. Ooh, reckon you made it back just in time, ma'am. Did you get wet? Nothing much to speak of. Gonna be a really bad storm. You all right, ma'am? You look very pale. There's nothing wrong. Is there a telephone I can use? Well, certainly there is, madam. It's over there in the corner by the door to the bar. Hester, I, I thought we agreed I that you... I know I said I wouldn't phone, but something... Look, I want you to get in the car now, this minute, and drive down here. Hester, what Don't am I... Don't ask questions, please, darling. I can't talk about it over no, but, the phone. But surely... You've got to get me away from here as quickly as you can. I'm certain that something... Look, Hester, if it's as bad as you say, why don't you just leave now and get the next train down here? There isn't a train until the morning, and I'm frightened that by then it will be too late. Please, if you love me, come uh, now. All right, darling, now take it easy. Take it easy. I'm on my way. Now. Look, it, it's going to take me about three hours to get there. I suggest you have a relaxing bath and then a meal in the restaurant there. I'll be with you about, uh, about nine o'clock. Now, take it easy. Everything will be fine. Thank you. All right, darling, I will. Come in. I've done as you asked, madam. Your bill's been made up and they won't charge you for tonight. That's very kind. You will let me know just as soon as my husband arrives? Yes, madam, of course. Oh, and there's this letter for you. It came by the second post this morning, but I'm afraid it must have got caught up with something else. I'm sorry, madam. I don't imagine it's anything very important. Thank you. I do hope your husband won't have too bad a journey. It's a wild night outside. Is the sea rock? Terrible, madam. You can hear it pounding away at the sea wall. Is there anything else, madam? No, nothing, thank you. And at Minsborough, there's no sea wall. The waves are battering away at the foot of the cliffs, bringing the sand sliding down. And his tomb is on the very edge of the cliff. <gasps> Get a grip on yourself. Celia's handwriting. Dearest Hester, I know I said I wouldn't write, but Richard tells me you're feeling much more like your own sweet self. 
And in any case, there's something I think you ought to know. I said I'd get my friend to see what he could find out about Roger Wyburn. There isn't very much, but this is the gist of it. He was at the court of Charles I, but wasn't a very reputable kind of character. There was some sort of scandal concerning one of the Queen's maids of honour, and after that he was distinctly persona non grata at court. And there were more sinister stories about him, hints that he had dabbled in the black arts. As the rumours got nastier, he fled the country and got caught up in the Protestant cause in the Thirty Years' War. He was injured at the Battle of Vlotho, wherever that may have been. That was in 1638. The following year, the girl to whom he had been betrothed since childhood came of age. He swore that no one would keep him from his bride and returned to claim her. But the ship carrying him from Flanders was wrecked in a violent storm off a place called Minsborough, and he was drowned. And that's it. But the thing I thought you should know is that her name was Colburn. And I seem to remember you saying that was the name of your mother's family. And her Christian name was Hester. It's nine o'clock, and the skies are clearing. There's a moon over the sea, and soon Richard will be here. <gasps> yes? Oh. That's wonderful. I'll be down in a moment. Good evening. I've uh, come to collect my wife. Your wife, sir? Yes. Well, we're driving back to London. Oh. I'm sorry, sir. She's left. Another gentleman came to collect her earlier. Another gentleman? Yes, sir. What sort of gentleman? I knew nothing about him, sir. I've never seen him before. What did he look like? He was a red-haired gentleman, sir, with a, a sort of scar in his mouth. There were footprints, which might have been hers, and they followed them until they came to an end, two miles away, in a great landslide of sand, which had fallen from the old churchyard on the cliff. It had brought down with it half the tower, and a gravestone with the body that had lain beneath. The gravestone was of Roger Wyburn, and his body lay by it, untouched by corruption or decay, although centuries had passed since it was interred. No further discovery was ever made. Rosalind Ayres played the doomed Hester, and Rosalind Thomas, her friend Celia. Richard, the husband, was David Goodland, and Norman Bird played Dr. Baring. The maid was Victoria Carling. The face was written by E. F. Benson, dramatized by Michael Bakewell, and directed by Jerry Jones. My name is Edward de Souza, the man in black. <laughs>